Violet and blue have the short wavelengths, and red has the long wavelengths. And um, so let me pop in a, a plot to show you how the human eye works. So uh, this is the wavelength. Uh, so it roughly matches the well, 400 doesn't quite line up. It, uh, it doesn't quite line up, but it's approximately right. And the way your eye works is you have these rods. And the rods are sensitive to the color. So you have three different kinds. You have a blue rod. Sorry, cone. Sorry about that. Uh, three different kinds of cones. You have a blue cone that sensitivity, so this is sensitivity, uh, is sensitive to violet, to blue, to a tiny bit of green. You got the idea. And then you have a green cone that's sensitive to green light. And then you have a red cone um, that is sensitive to red light, but look at the overlap between those two. Mm -hmm. So they're very similar. And so your eye samples electromagnetic radiation by a, a signal uh, in the green, in the red, and in the blue. So that's how you see. And then, not, not this is dotted in here, that's the rod, which confused me, which uh, uh, just gives you the intensity, so it doesn't, uh, it's a broadband. So just look at the color lines. So that's what the human eye does. That's what we see. We sample, uh, that's how we sample. Notice that we have a, a bit of a uh, uh, notch here. Okay, what about electromagnet, what about instruments that we can build? So the instruments that we can build, let me just show you a, a set of filters that we use in astronomy that were, the uh, University of Chicago was involved in inventing them for the Slum Digital Sky Survey. And these uh, filters are called UGRIS. U, G, R, I, and Z, and ignore the primes. And they go from violet, so here's about, uh, this is about, uh, sorry about the change in units here. So this is about a third of a uh, micron, and this goes out to about one micron, so this is violet to red. And just for comparison, uh, to roughly the same scale, so they go way beyond the red that we can see, out into the near infrared, and notice that they, you know, the, the, blue, the blue cone that we have doesn't quite match uh, the U and the, you know, they don't quite match up. So they sense light from objects in a different way. If you look at this, um, you know, this is what the intelligent designer would do, right? <laughs> so take full advantage of the electromagnetic spectrum. This, you know, that's not an intelligent designer. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is what an astronomical uh, instrument would do, trying to get as much of the spectrum as possible. Everybody with me? This is as technical as we get. Now I want to talk about, oh, uh, here's a camera. This uh, was the camera that uh, the University of Chicago was involved in building. In fact, I don't know, probably somebody in the audience knew Connie Bracosi, who was a graduate student who actually uh, is the person uh, most responsible for building this. And uh, so these are the filters. Um, and I'm not going to try to remember which one is which, but you see the different colors. These are the filters. And then the pattern has repeated itself, so you can see a big part of the sky. And so this is how the sky was imaged. And at the time, this was the biggest camera, at the time being about the year 2000, 100 megapixels. OK, so how do you make images? Or the way we like to, I want to use this word visualization. So I want to change things a little bit and get you to think about visualizing. So how would you make a true color image? If you really wanted to get a true image, I'm going to tell you that there is no such thing, and you shouldn't really be interested in that and just get over it. Um, so, well, you would use filters that look just like the filters of the eye. So I called them uh, red, green, blue. I could have called them blue, green, red. Um, so you would make measurements using a filter set like that, and then you would use those measurements to display red, green, and blue. And then, presumably, you would get it you would get an image that's exactly what the eye would see. Um, it's almost impossible because look, look at this. These are the kind of filters that you want. You want, really want your filters to, uh, you know, 
get as much of the light as possible and you want them to be narrow. So it's, astronomy filters don't match this, so it's almost impossible. And now I'm going to tell you, it's not even that desirable. The pictures are prettier when they're, when they're not true. <laughs> okay, so let, let me talk about false color. And when I say false color, I'm talking about virtually every image you've ever seen. So I went through a 12-step recovery from Ansel Adams' zone system. So I really completely got over, I'm totally in the false here. So um, how do you make a false color image? And then I'm going to show you a bunch of them, and then we'll get to the fun part of um, touring the universe. So you image with some filters, so maybe Ugris. And now you display it with some color palette. And you might use red, green, blue, but you might use some other color palette that, that makes a prettier picture. And I'll show you an example of that. The other reason that we want to use false color is that we often, you know, that the, the visible is only a factor of two in wavelength. And we have 15 orders of magnitude in wavelength that we can explore. And so, you know, how would you show a radio image? Well, you use false color. So you take a radio image and you take different wavelengths and you just display them as red, green, or blue, or whatever color palette you want. And, uh, well, then you can do, we'll do neutrinos, we'll do gamma rays, we'll do a bunch of different things. And then finally, of course, you can, we, I won't do this very much, but I just want to convince you that false color is, is not a mysterious thing. You use it all the time. We use it to display data, like the temperature, or the rainfall, uh, or something like that, where we take the data, and because we have these terrific eyes that can see in color, we visualize the data by colorizing it. So this is an example of false color. This is uh, uh, work by uh, Andy Warhol. Have people seen this before yeah. in the Tate Modern? No, okay. Well, it's a different audience than I usually talk to. And I think this is, <laughs> this is called the Maryland uh, Gift Pit. And uh, so there are 50 different images, actually 25 of them are black and white, but all of them have a different color palette. So this is false color. And of course, false color can bring out different features or create different effects. So um, here's one that you probably have all seen before. Uh, well, maybe not this particular one, but the average temperature from September, 9th, September 13th to 19th of 1998, you remember that? And uh, so red is really hot and green, I'm not quite sure why green is cold, but so you can visualize, and actually this, this uh, color palette, you could be a critic here, this is not the world's best color palette, or maybe I didn't select the, the best month, but you can see it was pretty warm over here in the deserts and so on and so forth. This is a fun one that I found on, on the internet. So this is the average wind speed. So if you're interested in putting up uh, you know, wind generation, uh, the color, and this is a much better palette going from green to blue here. So blue and purple or whatever that color is, is high wind speeds and the green is uh, very calm. So that's a way to visualize data. Uh, anybody know what this is? So this is the ozone hole. So you're actually visualizing numbers, the amount of uh, uh, ozone in the upper atmosphere, and this is Antarctica, and so the, the, the scale is not here, but those of you who know about the ozone hole know that this must be less ozone, and the green is more ozone. Um, and then this is a wonderful image of the sun in... Uh, soft x-ray, so uh, x-ray, that's the right after ultraviolet, shorter than ultraviolet. And we're gonna see other pictures of the sun, but this is what the sun looks like in soft x-rays. And you pull out these remarkable, stunning features uh, on the surface of the sun. And the reason you pull those out is that the sun mostly emits in the visible. That's probably why our eyes detect in the visible. Uh, but the hottest spots on the sun give off x-rays. The ones where all kinds of interesting things are going on give off x-rays. And so the x-rays allow you to get rid of the boring surface and see the exciting stuff that's going on. Okay, uh, let me talk a little bit about the instruments and work in a, another timeline here. 
and show you the acceleration. So this is Galileo. Uh, some of my colleagues studied with Galileo. Uh, and here's his telescope. And that was about 400 years ago, about 403 or 4, I forget. A little, a few more years than 400 years. He turned uh, the telescope to the sky and started studying the universe. And notice that he's looking through that end of the telescope, and there's a lens in there, and so on and so forth. So he started this out, actually, he started modern science, the idea that you would use instruments rather uh, than just your, uh, what God supplied you with. Uh, did I just say that? <laughs> Whoever supplied you, okay. Uh, so I want to show you, Yerkes Observatory is one of the most beautiful places on the world to visit. And uh, the 40-inch the, uh, telescope that was the world's largest telescope uh, around the turn of the century is housed in here, an enormous dome. And there it is. And if I, if that telescope were in this room, or if I took you up there, you would know how to use it. Right? Galileo would know how to use it. You stand at this end and look out of it. And there's a big lens. And I like to call it the world's largest telescope. And it was the world, sorry, the world's largest real telescope. I'll show you what modern telescopes look like in a second. And so this was in 1900. Telescopes looked the same that they did 300 years earlier. So um, the, actually, the person who raised the money for this and built this telescope is George Ellery Hale. He also founded our astronomy and astrophysics department. And uh, after getting the money for this telescope uh, from uh, Charles Yerkes, uh, he wanted to build a bigger telescope. And he decided that the place to put big telescopes was not in the Midwest, uh, near a lake, uh, with lots of humidity and fog and all of that, but in the hills of California. And so he went to Harper and explained that the future astronomy was in the hills of California, and Harper wished him well. <laughs> so he went off to California, and uh, three times more built the largest telescope. Um, he founded the Mount Wilson Observatory. I'm going to show you the 100-inch telescope that Hubble used to discover that, uh, gal that there were other galaxies in the universe and that the universe uh, had a big bang beginning. Here's its dome. And I don't know if people have visited Mount Wilson. It's a lovely, very uh, uh, nice place to visit. Here is the telescope, um, which is very, very different. So, you know, if we, put, if we put Galileo in this, he wouldn't know where to look. So there's a mirror here, and the light comes in, it's reflected off the mirror, and so there's no lens, it's reflective rather than refracting, and so there's a 100-inch mirror right here that gives you the scale of things. The light comes in and it's reflected up to this, which is called the prime focus, where you would put your instruments. Or you might put a mirror here to bring the light back down. And this was the, uh, actually the 60 inch before it was a big ref re reflector. And just another, I, I like to brag about uh, Chicago and the University of Chicago. The idea of a reflecting telescope and the modern reflecting telescope was born on the Yerkes. So there's, I forget, there's a 30s, I forget how big it is, but uh, there's a, the forerunner of all the modern reflecting telescopes was built up in Yerkes Observatory. And so now the biggest telescopes. Uh, it's no longer California, uh, it's the mountains of Chile or, or Hawaii. And these are the two largest telescopes uh, on the planet, the 400-inch uh, Keck telescopes on top of Mauna Kea. And then, of course, there's the Hubble telescope. Anybody ever heard of that? <laughs> and it's got a 100-inch, uh, but it's above the atmosphere. So it's not as big, but the atmosphere blurs the images. And what else? Now we're back to this. So uh, let's see. This little scale up says penetrates the Earth's atmosphere. And you'll see a lot of ends here. So visible does, radio does, uh, but almost everything else doesn't. And so in terms of building other telescopes, a lot of them are in space. But radio does. This is a thousand foot radio dish in Puerto Rico at Arecibo. If you haven't, if you ever get a chance to visit it, it's absolutely spectacular. Uh, so that's radio. Microwave, so this is uh, an experiment that one of my colleagues uh, 
uh, Steve Meyer was involved in. This is the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, which mapped the microwave sky, and I'm going to show you that right at the end. Um, here is uh, a telescope that looks at the universe in millimeter. Now, it turns out millimeter, if you go to a really good high and dry site, you can see most of the universe, and that's the South Pole. And this is a funny looking telescope. That's actually the telescope, that's the mirror, and it's a 10 meter mirror. And so, John Carlstrom uh, built this at the South Pole, and it does fantastic science. Uh, infrared, remember infrared. So there's a telescope uh, called the Spitzer Space Telescope that looks at the universe in infrared. And then in X-ray, it's the Chandra. So let's see, Hubble was Chicago, Chandra was Chicago. Uh, and then in gamma ray, it's the Fermi gamma ray uh, telescope. Oh, by the way, Spitzer went through a pair. <laughs> okay, and then coming up uh, is James Webb. It will be infrared, it will be big, six meters, so that's about 240 uh, inches. It'll be at L2. Anybody know where L2 is? That's where you want to be. So uh, it's uh, about a million miles from the Earth, so it's a really nice, dark, good site for astronomy. So it's like the hills of California. And it's named after James Webb, uh, who was the, uh, one of, I forget which administrator, he was, but he was not a scientist. Okay, <coughs> on to the uh, artful universe. Um, so who figured out that the universe would be nice to look at? When, when did we figure that out? And I thought that should be part of the story. Uh, Charles Messier, in the 18th century, uh, used a telescope to stu study the sky, and he found a bunch of fuzzy things called nebulae. And people didn't know what the nebulae were. There was a raging debate that Hubble set up. Um, are they gas clouds within our galaxy, uh, or are they other galaxies that are far away? Actually, Hubble settled it in the following way. It's the way science often gets done. So um, yeah, a lot of them are gas clouds in our galaxy. Whatever. Uh, actually, they're pretty to look at. But uh, a lot of them are external galaxies. And uh, so he identified Andromeda. I'll show you an image of Andromeda. But Messier cataloged, I think, about 110 of these fuzzy patches in the sky. And we'll, we'll look at a lot of them, because most of the pretty objects, many of the pretty objects in the universe to look at have Messier uh, numbers. Um, so there's M31. I think I got this number right. That's Andromeda, one of the few galaxies you can see with the naked eye. It's about two million light years away from us. This is the galaxy that Hubble studied and was able to see a certain kind of star uh, that's well calibrated that you can use to figure out the distance. And it's, uh, by showing that it was two million light years away, he showed that it wasn't in our galaxy and was its own galaxy. So this is a um, ground-based